This is the Kick Aspirational Podcast. I'm Dave Vanderveen, and today we're here with Brian Ben in Brian Ben's backyard. Uh, welcome, Brian, to the Kick Aspirational Podcast, or maybe I should say thank you for oh, letting yeah. me be in your home. No. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always like to give a little background because some, you know, there's, I have a wide kind of eclectic mix of people on the podcast. It's all about helping people think about how they can break through barriers in their own life, but... Right. Um, but also think about how they can create the world they want to live in rather than the one somebody else defines for them. Yeah. And yeah. The, the other, um, I bought a painting from you. Yeah. Uh, over Christmas. Yeah, it <laughs> took me like, a while to come get it. Yeah, that was that was that was rad. I was like, wow, he he said he's going to come, or or he was planning on coming, and then, but I've learned, I've learned, yeah, you just never know. <laughs> but it, yeah. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, I got to know you through. Gabe, I mean, indirectly through Gabe Sullivan, because yeah. Gabe had shot a, a photo of you that we have with the crash helmet on, riding a coupon. Yeah, bikes. yeah, one of the most. Uh, that was out of all my surfing antics. That antics. That was. Uh, yeah, it was. It, it was to put a helmet on and then goggles and then actually go out to surf. It's actually. I, I got really. Mess. It, it kind of messes with you. You know, claustrophobic, claustrophobic or whatever. I was. I think I was telling you I, I did an off the lip on this coupe box. Tom Blake style foam, we we actually made up foam instead of wood, cook box, and I didn't even think if I would have fallen. Remember, I did that off the lip, uh, and Gabe and and I, if I would have fallen, I I didn't realize that the water could go underneath your helmet and possibly snap your neck. Oh wow! And so I didn't fall like that, you know, but yeah. I because it, it had no drain holes in it, and yeah, I mean that the shoot went off super well, but you're not surfing in helmets too much. Either. No, 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 heck no, <laughs> I don't. Gabe's here too with us. I should just mention oh, if yeah. you're listening to this, he's uh, video. We're going to release a video of this and showcase some of Brian's art and his images and his maybe some of his music. Um, Brian, part of what was drawn to me, I mean, one, I'd seen some of the very creative images of you surfing, and then yeah. got to know you a little bit through Gabe, yeah. and then started following your Instagram and seeing that you painted, and then fell in love with some of the painting art. You know, some of the art, yeah. the fine f- fine art you were doing. Yeah. How did you get to a place, you've created a world here. When I came to visit your home in San Juan, um, I mean, this this home is like a, a world you've created. Uh, I said to Gabe, you're like an, I like to use the term auteur, you know, you've, like Wes Anderson's kind of an auteur. He creates, when he makes a film, like the entire, he creates a new world, right? Yeah, yeah. There's a whole style. How did you get to this place in life right now? Um, well, I mean, since I was young and strapping aluminum cans to my back with a string with a clothespin in my mouth and I'm diving underwater to uh, looking up to my uncle that was Rocky Sabo that was a pro surfer and wanting to be like him and but yet I was so much a skateboarder and I was a little inland so when I was young and and so you know bombing hills on my skateboards and opening my jacket to slow myself down (laughs) and he'd give me these patches that said Pepsi and then surf team underneath and I wanted to be on the Pepsi surf team, you know, and all yeah. this stuff. So, and then to actually, um, if I couldn't be that, then I would want to build my own little world around that. So I would, you know, whatever I would get into, I'd start inevitably painting on the wall um, in my room and using that as a uh, kind of like a three dimensional canvas of my expression of what I was into. And then, uh, it started, you know, as I got older uh, and, and started working for Becker Surfboards, actually, in 1984, I, I started drawing on skateboards. And I was already doing this at my grandmother's house in, in Dana Point in the early 80s. But by the time I got a job, I was actually starting to draw on skateboards. And then it, I, I would go back home and listen to old records and... and uh, got inspired from Arthur Lyman or, or, or Martin Denny Jungle Records to uh, my uncle, uh, my other uncle that's older than my my pro-surfing uncle, Rocky. Uh, he would have all the... He grew up in the early 60s, and so did my mom. So I'd get into their records, you know, and then so... Uh, and I'd get very influenced by the music, and it was just in me to experience that life. So I was I've always had a retro... Uh, thing about me I, now the, and, and it hasn't ended I've always liked to look at my grandparents old photos I was just like I don't know if it, it, people use the term old soul I don't think I don't know if that's it 
I just, I don't know, for some reason that was my thing. So as I've gotten older, if I've, I've, I look back and I go, oh, okay. One time I saw a, uh, it was a documentary on abstract expressionalists. And I, I went at that point, I really resonated with those guys and the whole kind of beat generation and stuff. And I, that's right about when surfing magazine started, you know, 60, you know, can connect these dots now. And I, the, the coolest thing I ever saw was in a 64 surf guide or an early 60s surf guide where they're showing state park, you know, over there before Malibu in Santa Monica. And somebody had spray painted this philosopher looking face hmm. in one of the tunnels going to the beach, I guess, or whatever. And that grabbed me. I go, there it is right there. So he was expressing himself had nothing to do with graffiti necessarily or anything. It was it was just, in my own mind, I pictured some guy back then listening to jazz, expressing himself on this on this thing that somebody captured on a photo and put it in a surf guide magazine, you know, from the early 60s. And I've actually kind of built this whole thing from that. It, yeah. it sounds really wild, but... Well, okay, that's kind of funny. If we, we're kind of the same... I mean, you're a little older than me, but we're roughly the same age, same era, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Um, we were both born in the mid to late 60s. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so I studied philosophy. I used to paint philosophers' faces because I always felt like that was like you were capturing in a, sort of who they are that way, right? And my parents literally just donated an old Burton snowboard that I had left in their basement to a local surf shop in Michigan, and it has Hobbes... Um, face painted on wow. it. Um, so anyways, I used, I used to paint Camus, a lot of different art philosophers, because yeah. I think their face kind of captures some of their ideas a lot of times. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's kind of like, if you even look at punk rock in the 80s, like, it, we're always trying to search for authenticity and actually relations and right. relating to something. Right. And, uh, yeah, so I, maybe that's, you know, dur- I know, I know during the, I studied a little bit of Kerouac and a little bit of... Uh, uh, the different poets from that era and and basically you know for me I like mid-century they call it mid-century now but back then I was like I was just gravitated towards the simplicity of it's kind of like Dora's surfing yeah perfect example um, I know he did you know he, he was a colorful person yeah but his surfing uh, had its own style and I gravitated a lot of people gravitated to it regardless of you know as a person versus his his style was amazing his style was flat amazing to this point I I, I don't even know somebody that would move me to to, to, besides you know um, I could appreciate other surfers totally Um, Steve Bigler was a really good nose writer but but Dora just had this thing about him and you know certain people have that like Bowie you know or just have their thing and and I gravitate towards that and get inspired by that and uh so that's how the abstract expressionists were to me. Um, it was kind of, kind of like new beginnings, you know, like like in surfing, you know, like late fifties, early sixties, you know. So I've so my the world that I've created kind of was based on that. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've kind of gotten all the way down back into the teens, you know. But my my thing is always around the late fifties, you know. Yeah, well, I, th- I think that world. We were talking when, when I first came to your home. You were showing me your living room, and you know, it really is kind of your home was built in the fifties mm-hmm. as part of a uh, kind of one of the early suburbs in Southern California, yeah, at least in yeah. Orange County. And there's some features to it that reminded me of my grandparents' home, which is kind of built around the same era. Yeah. And I think when we were talking about some of that, you know, there's a nostalgia that we have, and, and that's a very powerful emotion, right? It's oh like my gosh, yeah. Something For that me. it's like going back into a time machine. In that's where. That's where. That's the. That's the. That's the. The crux of my of my paintings. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to emulate any abstract expressionist uh, style or anything. Right, right. It's 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 the era that you think. Oh, we used to go. Oh, man, longboarders used to do that, or that guy used to do that, or you know, we'd always want to, you know, kind of go back and really excavate into their, you know, their scene. You know. Well, I think it's fair. I mean, you know, the, I think we were talking about this a little while ago, but I think the when I mean, you look at modern or contemporary art, where you know, these painters are having conversations with each other. They're they're doing something and then somebody else is doing something else or they're pulling something from the past, bringing it to the future. And I feel like a lot of the work that you're doing, whether it's the hot rods you're building or the, the boards yeah. that you're building or the paintings that you're doing, I mean, the home that you've created, yeah. you're, you're doing a great job of bringing us 
I would say it's more like sort of reminding us of the past rather than trying to recreate it, right. but also doing it in a way that's very modern. Yeah, and that's one of the, not it's a terrible word, payoffs of staying consistent in what you're into. Uh, you do, I, I, I used to be trying to be a real purist of, of things like, uh, of eras, and I, I came to the conclusion one time when I was getting in publications for writing these old Tom Blake wood hollow boxes, wood, you know, surfboards, um, and it got to the point where, oh my gosh, like, I want to start writing my other contemporary longboards, you know, and I, I went to my wife, Rivka, and I'm like, Riff, and she goes, well, she calls me Byron, she goes, Byron, she goes, you're you, regardless of what you write, I'm like, oh, that's I didn't even think of it, yes, <laughs> it was huge, because I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I start getting into this bondage of, this compulsive, compulsive bondage of having to um, stay within my uh, created world, which um, <laughs> it's very freeing when you can go, oh, I can step outside of my creative wor- world and still be who I am, you know? So You, you don't want it to be a cage. You want it, you want it to be something that you can create that, that remi- it, it enhances your world but doesn't, yes. doesn't, doesn't hold you to it. And the, uh, the complexity about that, uh, that, maybe it's cool that we're capturing this, is that's where confusion comes in. They're like, oh, okay, I'm going to listen to... Uh, to Grand Funk Railroad, you know, and uh, go, you know, I, I want to go skate now, you know, or shoot, I'm listening to uh, Bill Evans or, uh, you know, Bud Shank, and shoot, now, now I'm stuck in the, right. in, in the mids, in the, you know, the, the, the jazz, West Coast jazz thing, like, uh, you know. Well, we're both children of the 60s, but we grew up through the 80s, like, so oh we experienced the, the, you know, the music of our grandparents, music of our parents, yep. you know, maybe more Rockabilly folk, to rockabilly. New Wave to Mod. Yeah. Yeah. And you were active in the punk scene in the 80s? You still, you, we, well, interesting thing was, is I started out, um, uh, I started out as actually, my grandfather passed away when I was going into high school, so my grandmother didn't want to live alone, so... That's when I'd get into all my uncles and my grandfather's records. So I was listening to Martin Denny, to uh, the Beach Boys, to uh, the Lively Ones, to all this, you know, this stuff. And that I actually was into early '60s surf. I want to call it. Yeah. And then by the tail end of '84, I was really into dressing all rockabilly. But in, intermixed in that, um, uh, I would listen to punk rock uh, in in '80 80, '81 you know, with my friend um, up at his house in Dana Point, and he brought down his dad's Wardy longboard, and it, the first time I rode a longboard was on the left at Doheny. Oh, wow. And uh, that's what got me into longboarding. So, yeah, punk rock's always been in there, you know. Um, but I can't... I There was a time when I might have gotten extra punk, but I think my punk years came later, actually. Okay. Yeah. Like, like a in late the late bloomer. 80s? Uh, no. <laughs> Even later than that. Yeah. Oh wow! After well, punk, like well, post punk. I'd be listening to my, or I'd be out there riding my quarter pipe uh, in 1980, and a guy brought me an exploited tape. I, it was just a blank tape that had exploited on it. Right. And you're listening to the sex and violence, sex and violence. And you're like, <laughs> I don't even know what this is. Like, what do you mean, <laughs> sex and violence? What does that, that even mean? Right. And I didn't even know who the band was. Um, and talking about a queen, the queen, and right. like queen of who? Right. Like, Who's the queen? <laughs> And I'm like, you know... We have no queen in Southern yeah, California. Yeah, well, I don't know if there's a queen, you know, and uh, there's Dairy Queen. No, <laughs> but anyway, uh, political, I, that went over my head, but the, the, but the power, power of the music made you skate radicaler, right. but more radical. And I remember getting a white blank tape that changed my, my cropped hair, and I went and grabbed my dad's holiest jeans and a striped shirt that I still have in the house. Wow. And went up to the... Uh, got all punked out. And went up to the arcade and started playing video games, and I was punk rock from then on. Well, I think yeah, so. it, it seems like skate culture. I mean, I think to your point, you know, I didn't start listening to hardcore punk and still until I started skating, right? Because there was some connection between whether it was Agent Orange or the different hardcore bands that were into skating. It yeah. seemed to have a connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Punk is actually. Yeah, as you get older, I mean, there's different genres of punk to me, you know. Yeah, we were talking about like the Clash. Some people Clash. consider punk, but like a much earlier. I never version. thought the Clash was punk. Right. I liked. Uh, I mean, I bought Combat Rock, and that's when I got into the Clash because of MTV. Sure. Um, before that, it was the Exploited or or Sex Pistols. Um, I was in the Kiss Army, and I remember <laughs> talking my parents into in 1976. They were on Don Kirshner's rock concert, and I remember 
talking to my parents and let me stay up till 12 to watch Kiss. Right. I'm watching Kiss, but then they're on this simulcast, this satellite thing, and they're showing these guys, I think, spitting out in the audience in, in England. And I'm like, what is that, you know? <laughs> right. And I actually Googled the concert. I got the concert, but I didn't get the... Was it the Sex Pistols? Uh, well, I don't know who yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. It, could, it probably was. And, to, you know, the Sex Pistols was one of the first punk bands I started listening to. You yeah. Know? And I still think... They're, they're probably the, the only one that would have been big enough to be on a simulcast with kids, right? Right, right, right. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. No, that's fascinating. It's great that, you know, one part of the thing that I love about podcasts is you get to pick up part of what's going on around, around yeah. you. We're in, the, we're in your amazing backyard that looks like uh, a mid-century modern pool you'd imagine and your neighbor's working on something over yeah, there, which yeah. is great. He's construction. It's good. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about when we think about, like, what gives people purpose is how... Um, how what you're passionate about marries to what you're actually good at marries to where you can actually earn some kind of an income. You know, mm-hmm. you have some kind of a, uh, it doesn't have to be a lot of money, but people are giving you value back for the value you're putting out into the world. Yeah. You seem to have been able to figure that out. Those three circles, that Venn diagrams, you know, yeah, <laughs> Brian well, Ben's right in the middle of that right now, it feels like. How did you, how did you, did you, how did you get to a point where somebody was saying, hey, you've got a style and I'd like to buy a piece of that somehow? Well, I, I, you know, I was working for Becker Surfboards, 85, and then I left. What were um, you doing for them? Well, I was, at the time, I was just selling, I, was, I, I got hired in you know, building skateboards in 1985 for the Christmas Rush. Okay. Then I started working on, you know, in, you know, in the shop, in the floor, and, and then I, I left for a year, actually, um, uh, and so I, and I was competing in longboarding contests, and I I left longboard surfing. Yeah, longboard surfing, and uh, so I I end up having a tiff with somebody at work. I won't mention anything yeah. beyond that. And so I left for a year, and so I went in uh, for my buddy um, Roy at the surf spot down in, down in San Clemente, and he kind of started. He he kind of turned me on to a little bit of of. Uh, this beat beatnik generation kind of thing and 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 it was like mad magazine he had one and it was like the the hipsters christmas like it was the night before christmas and all through the pad not a hipster was swinging not even old dad you know and i was like whoa 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 what's this language you know and then he gave me a googie book you know and i was like whoa you know and so anyway wait what's a googie book Go- googie architecture is like i think alan hess and t- coined it or something i it, it was kind of like mid-century re- it. revisited in the '80s, you could still go and see, or even now, you can see see some of this. Like the mids, uh, yeah, like like um, like uh, like Pans a restaurant in, in Culver City, or uh, uh, there was actually John Lautner did a Googie restaurant. Okay. You know? um, and anyway, so I again, uh, my imag- imagination soared. Also, my my wife. When I was starting to date my wife in 1988, we'd go into Rizzoli Books, and and I got I pulled out this case study house program thing, and anyway, yeah, we, lot, we were talking about some of that, right? Yeah. The case study house program and the whole mid-century stuff. But anyway, so I took all that with me in my head, and um, Rifkin and I decided we wanted to get married. So I asked for my old job back at Becker. Make a long story short. And I got it back, and, and so they gave me it back, and I started working into doing displays. Um, the display lady would come in and p- pin the surf shirts and all that stuff on the walls, and, but then people would want to buy that, so they'd take it off, and then I started redoing her stuff. And as I she was phasing out, I was phasing in, ah. and then I started, uh, again, uh, I saw that documentary, and I started... Um, uh, expressing myself what was in me to make these displays really uh, in my own head making cools for people to check out to look at to dazzle them to whatever so making kind of original displays yeah. that you wouldn't buy get out of a box basically right yeah just and um, make a long story short the owners of the company um, would came down and saw my work in the Mission Bio store uh, and the El Toro store and they were from the Hermosa store and then Malibu Becker surf shops. Sure. And so anyway, they go. We really like this. So, I they started wanting me to do that in all the stores. 
How many stores did they have? They, I remember they had one in well, CDN. Well, Hermosa and, was yeah. number one, and then Mission Viejo was number two. And I was down here in Dana Point, so... Um, in Mission Viejo. And then, uh, then I went to El Toro, and then Malibu, and then Corona Del Mar. And by the time Corona Del Mar hit, that's when I had carte blanche to, to actually design the whole store. Yeah. And then... That was um, a piece of art. Yeah. It, yeah, it was crazy. It was... Yeah, it was. It was. It, was that an old bank? What was that? That was an old bank. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was an old. But bank. Like a very cool, like mid-century looking yeah, brick it was, bank. It was yeah, a, it's a pie shape, and it was right in the. And I put these two philosopher guys out outside, you know, and one, uh, and a girl doing like the, uh, kind of like the sh- uh, the cha cha, you know. Yeah. And so, um, which actually, to be a little bit spicy, I during the whole um, not global warming, but it was like the the ozone layer. Right. Uh, for Becker, I remember being a little smart alecky, and I did this shirt called Charcoal People because people were sizzling <laughs> in the sun. One was a philosopher, one was doing a cha cha, one was like, I don't know, just four characters. And that shirt sold and sold and sold and sold. And I, I was, and, and it gave me kind of a, a badge of like where I was at that time. Right. And so I started applying those um, sculptures, I call that on the sides of those buildings that, you, you know, right. that we'd see. And then, uh, anyway, um, so I was do- clipping along, and then in 1999, I got picked up, I got discovered. And uh, I was doing side work at the time. People would see the sh- stores, and they'd, they'd hire me out, you know, to build a shop. My, my boss, Dave Hollander, was uh, so cool, um, he allowed me to, to, to freelance as I was doing, you know, doing, stuff, yeah. doing b- with Becker. And so I got to do a lot of freelancing for company, surf companies and for other shops or whatever, um, if, if somebody wanted a shop built, you know, up in L.A. or whatever. And then so, uh, but then Rhonda Saboff uh, from Dirt Gallery came into the Malibu store and saw this, to me, in the sunglass case, she saw that one of the little paintings that I did of one of the employees, uh, Mitch Taylor, that actually still there in Malibu uh, working. Uh, and and she goes, who who did this? That she asked one of the guys. And so anyway, I got a phone call. This Rhonda, and she wanted to come down and see my my you know my my library or what I was into. And it was architecture and cars. So you were I, painting a lot of mid-century houses, like case study houses, well, right? Well, no, she she initiated that. Okay. I was painting whatever. If I was into uh, cars, in fact, see, I don't understand Becker because. I started out carte blanche with them, and they, I, I literally, it was, it was invented through Becker the style that I got to do because it was just me, and I was doing whatever I was inspired to do inside the stores. So all of a sudden, it became a world, right? In these stores, and I got to express myself for years through those stores, at least a good twenty years straight. Wow. Um, and so, and when I got discovered halfway through from the gallery in North Hollywood, then as an artist, she defined, she picked mid-century art. Or also Ronchomp, you know, uh, or so, or I mean, uh, Cabousier, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and, um, uh, and then also uh, the Pan Pacific Auditorium, you know, um, it could... Whatever she was just picking these iconic things for me she to paint. Was maybe putting together like a modernist collection. Yes. Of, yeah. The one thing that I learned from that as well is so, she, we talked. She came down. She looked. She said, "Okay, let's do it." You know, and we'll call it architecture, architecture, something like that. And I said, "Okay." And um, a little side note, uh, she was talking about being. Uh, just being, you know, paint, and so anyway, I said okay. So she gave me a list of things to paint. I started painting them. She came down uh, to check my work one time, and she looked kind of like looked at my work and looked a little towards a little funny uh, on, uh, expression on her face. I'm like, Rhonda, what's what what yeah. what is it? She goes, Well, these look kind of confused. And I go, Well, you kind of wanted me to be painterly, right? And she goes, Oh no. She goes, I should have never have said painterly. <laughs> Because I was starting to blend and stuff. It wasn't the same stuff I was doing at Becker that she sure. really was attracted to or liked. And she goes, no, I, I, she goes, I just, I shouldn't have ever said that. She goes, I just wanted you to paint these houses like you paint for Becker, what you're already doing naturally. Right. And I learned in life, boom, if you could catch this, be yourself of who you are, 
doing this and and it just comes naturally and then so I redid the ones that I had done and she came back and it was like the, the show was a hit yeah um, I, I, I started learn uh, meeting couples and people um, through the gallery there that, that, that started collecting my work and it became a, a beautiful relationship with all these people uh, because of that and that's where it started well, I think like when we were talking earlier, you, you showed me one of your um, images that I really liked that I, ju I just said, I used, was using it as an adjective, not meaning that you were trying to emulate somebody, but I said, oh, that oh, reminds yeah. me of Rothko. Rothko, yeah. And you always have to be careful, right? <laughs> I'm not saying that you're trying to copy Rothko. No, but, gosh, no, I've, no, I've never tried to copy art. No. Yeah, yeah, no, uh -huh. art informs art, and I think it's just natural for people to, we all grew up with things that we yeah. pull from, right? Well, I've seen people, there, the thing is, is there's see if I, if I say something it might be somebody that maybe copies another artist might go oh but me personally I get my inspiration from photographs right um, I have copied uh, I copied a John Severson one one time in one of the stores of his uh, one with Jack Haley uh, it was it was kind of a, a famous painting that he did and I was doing it as a as a as a front piece to a, one of the counters in the surf shops well um and, and so, yes, that was a copy of that, but my paintings actually had to be, I, the style developed because I had to be quick and to the point in the stores. I couldn't do, I couldn't sit there and spend all this time on one painting. I had to, I had to merchandise, hang with guide wires. Uh, it was like sure. contrast of materials and mediums and whatever, uh, you know, like paint or uh, uh, mediums meaning like, what do they call, you know, like contrasts of materials. Sure. And... Um, so I had to be quick and to the point, which it wasn't, I didn't feel rushed, but so my style comes out of a, a thing of expressing yourself in a diligent kind of like one line or one point to get your point across, make it colorful and make it flow with the day. So most of my sections I'd be working, I'd have seven to eight hours, you know, right. a day to work, sometimes five. And so I'd have to set up the thing. So my paintings come... Uh, not that I ever feel rushed, but that's just how they flow. So when people well, see that and and they go, oh, that's so I got to develop that style through that. But it reminds me, I mean, it's, there's an elegance to it, I think, because of that. I, if you look at, you know, if you think about writing, right, if you think of, what, well, you know, Hemingway, obviously, very elegant writer, very spa, very sparing, but it takes a lot of work to get to that point where you can do that yeah. simply and easily. And I think, too, like if you look at, um, uh, Name just escaped me, but if um, you know, he did the big prints in the '60s. Warhol. Yeah, Andy Warhol. You know, he started in in advertising, doing yeah. a lot of a lot and of album covers, right? Because yeah. he had to do it, and he had to just pump yeah. out art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I build cars once in a while. Um, <laughs> you built built some hot amazing rods hot rods, and, yeah. And and that you know, and so we were we were rebuilding this car that we built to drag race a biplane, and. Um, and I prayed actually for inspiration because I didn't know what direction to go with my art after that. And this was like four or five years ago. And what hit me straight off was, oh, remember those ma 60s magazines that you, that you bought at Tippy Canoes mm. in the early 80s? Start painting those as, co uh, start painting the covers as paintings. Like, and then the, the illustration that hit me is like Andy Warhol did with the Campbell Soup Can. And my business card went from like, oh my gosh, I remember going into a liquor store or somewhere to get something to drink, and it was declined. I couldn't even afford something at a 7-Eleven to drink. Wow. To completely being in the black. Right. And paying that off, and actually, and I started painting the covers of Surfer Magazine, Surf Guide Magazine. Uh, skateboarder. All, yeah. Skateboarder. And it was it was that same thing. It was that pop kind of, and it it was rad because as an artist that expresses himself through color, it was actually a a rad thing to be able to um, you, you know to to have, have the guidelines, and I and I always you know gave props to to the to the I actually met the guy um, while I was the first or second year I was doing these surfer covers. Um, 
that used to do the layouts for Surfer Magazine with oh, John wow. Severson. Yeah, so anyway, um, that, was a, that was a neat expression as well. So things kind of build on things, kind of build on things, and so that's how my art's kind of been. Um, but the, the most thing that inspires me the most is the music and the photographs. Right. Well, and it's, you know, it's maybe it's switching gears a teeny bit here. You just, I think we were just talking about how, how intimate your art is, how authentic it is, even though it may, some of them, some of it may pull from other elements of the past. Um, you just came out of a recording, you did, just did like a, yeah, big it, day of recording yeah. that was very heartfelt that was tied deeply to your family and your values yeah and some of the emotional things that are connected to loss and 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 did it all in four or five hours which why is my leg twitching or why is this why is my hand I was like I'm so funny how, my, how many songs did you record in we did hours? 11 or 12 and but these are songs you've been working on for how long I've been sitting it's it you know everybody well people that have a guitar they always have that sit that that one that they sit down on the couch with and play. Yeah. So yeah, I wrote those songs I've been doing for six or seven years um, after my son's death uh, from a, from complications after brain surgery. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I I I they're, they're we're actually sitting in your son's room right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's now converted into kind of like a mini gallery. But yeah. So um, do, do you want to talk about? That that Cole. the song she wrote oh. and Cole a little bit and where that how because I, what I thought was kind of well, and you can talk about anything you want but I thought what was powerful when we were in your gallery earlier talking about this was you know you mentioned that you have all this we all have things that we're dealing with inside yeah and these songs express a lot of that very authentically yeah you're, you're talking to God you're talking about your son well could you imagine uh, being an artist working kind of as in a charmed life you have a charmed life working for surf shops and the, you know and and um you know my mom my mom in 07 uh died a ho- horrible lung her lungs were giving out and my wife was there with her while I was at work at the surf shops dancing for my mom for like a month straight um my mom was intubated and my and my mom was a liver of a, a, a liver of life yeah she loved life. life she yeah. was she was a, a beautiful lady and with with tons of life and 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 her life and my it was just a blessing and then you know going through that part um like i was literally holding my wife's hand when my wife was holding my mom's hand Mm -hmm. when she went home to with the lord and so that was heavy and then and then my son you know could you imagine losing a son and 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 you're there on your, you're there as as the sun's setting at night. And you're like, I don't even know how I'm gonna. What, what do you do? What what in the world do you do? And so, <clears throat> we actually owned a sailboat. He bought it mostly, but we actually sailed for a year. Um, and he was after brain surgery. He was partially disabled. He was a marine fighting in Afghanistan. And a chaplain came out to his fob, said, "You don't look good, marine." And he's like, "I'm not doing good, sir." He got out of his combat unit eight months. Back, he was Kanoe Bay, he went through Europe, got released from Kanoe Bay back to our house, hit the back of his head messing with some buddies. Uh, we, he was blacking out for a week. We didn't know, my mother-in-law's a, a nurse, said it sounds like a hemorrhage. Take him in, get an MRI, full brain, brain tumor in the back of his head. Came out of surgery. They got everything, but but his motor neurons were never the same. He was paralyzed. Anyway, complications, heavy narcotics to try to keep his pain center down. Uh, didn't didn't make it. With the Lord, we're I'm down on on the sailboat. You know, fast forward. My wife's up here with her friends, and I, we, we got close. My wife and I got closer. I know some people. It, it, Grief and is horrible a thing, yeah. and we, she was the love of my life. I stuck by her side. We stuck by each other's and our daughter. I started writing these songs. So fast forward seven eight years, and we recorded these songs. Um, you know, uh, and they go from you know uh, when the, when the breeze is on the ocean and it has a frightful gale, and you know, and, it, and you, it's like. You want to have courage, but you fail, you know, and, and, and 
it talks about the Lord giving you strength to make it every day and you know or uh, you know all these these songs end up turning out to be encouraging songs rather than you know desolate desolate songs and and so you know after all these years you know I finally lay them out and uh, it's kind of vulnerable it's kind of like the one thing coming around to the abstract expressionless art artists even like could be Rothko could be Motherwell it could be de Kooning could be whoever you know uh, from that era is is I think at one point when you're when you're just if you if God's given you a gift and you have it in you of whatever you do but if you've got the gift of art to express through and you express it through your art it's going to come out and 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 people are going to go whoa you know uh you know um during that hard time my daughter would play piano the most beautiful i've ever heard it's incredible because she had it in her to get out you know my wife wrote very incredible stuff about uh that in her blog you know and so you know these songs that came out of me were just actually how i was being healed and now you know and so that same thing comes through uh, through art. If you if you see real beauty, and and it comes out on canvas, you're going to see beauty. And it's not necessarily you're almost like a vehicle to express that beauty that that if God can make a potato bug to this most beautiful flower ever, right? My gosh, that's so intricate. It, it, it goes back to it sounds the heaviest book in the Bible is Job, the, what he went through. But, but and God goes, look at who I am, and that's why. So if He says, don't judge, and don't, you don't have to figure it out. And know that I'm with you. And oh my gosh, you could. There's there's so much beauty that can come out of that, and so all I am is a, is one person that's seen that beauty, expressing it, you know, and getting the opportunity to. Yeah, to express myself through paintings or music or whatever. But and, and I'm just one person. I'm, I'm sure it happens to a gazillion people, you know. Well, no, I, I think to your point, right, like great beauty comes often out of tremendous suffering. And I think what was striking me as we were talking about that today was how honest you are about it, that you're not afraid to have those honest conversations about your faith, about the pain, about loss, yeah. things that a lot of people like to bury or embarrassed to talk about. And, and you were even mentioning, you know, you had this amazing new Bowie painting out, and oh my gosh! And you were you were con- you were questioning yourself, right? You were questioning your own like, should I paint over this? Is this? And your wife was like, hey, why don't you go to the store and I'm gonna hide this before you get back. <laughs> well, yeah, Bowie's got a lot of depth, and uh, I she 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 asked me last night at dinner. She's like, why do you paint Bowie? And I and I go, well, and almost er, not the not this is not a pat me on I'm just going to be striking every Bowie painting I I, I paint it sells I'm not doing it to go oh I'm going to you know well it's, uh, you know money's a blessing in its in its thing but also the expression that people connect with some or I don't know the word connect but how well feel it whatever you want to call it yeah of of, of a painting uh and, and Bowie is just I mean think of another person there's there's uh you know the singer from the cure or there's uh, mm-hmm. there's Joe Strummer or there's uh there's Man Ray you You're know right, the right. photographer you know uh there's all these guys that in history that you're like whoa you know there's uh and you know all these artists and stuff but you know to me uh, in my generation you know I, I I get a kick out of or I not get a kick but I somehow Bowie's the thing but some of his he he went through a lot of complex he he has a whole his whole life you know is trauma complexity or yeah and struggle and, yeah and uh i can't black stars heaviest thing i've ever I don't, I don't even i can't even watch it right but i can watch his i mean I, some of the th- few things and but my gosh talking about a creative person uh you know and and every time like like man you, you know uh, Life on Mars, that that, be- that that video that they shot of him and that, you, you know, uh, his theatrical stuff and is is just incredible. So you know, and Joe Strummer on the other end, pretty rugged and raw, you know, combat rock and, and rock the Casbah when he's shuffling his dirt, his feet in the dirt, and it's 
Well, and, and they had a wide variety of styles too. I mean, I, people think of the popular Clash songs, and, and, yeah. and they're popular because I think they're great. But there's also like Bank Robber, which isn't played as much, but it's like we were talking about. You know, it's that dubstep or yeah. um, oh. sort of Scottish kind of tune. Well, this is painting a picture, and, and I'm this, this is just true. But I saw Joe Strummer shortly before he passed away on stage, and. I want to do a song about an American hero, Johnny Appleseed. And I'm like, Johnny Appleseed? That's <laughs> the Bible and the apple seeds. And I was like, whoa, you know, and I didn't even know if it was Joe Strummer right away because I was at a, it was a rockabilly kind of punk festival thing. And I'm like, what's kind of, there's an Irish like folk band here. Yeah. Because it was a Muscaleros, you know, but then I missed uh, London Calling and the guy goes, no, dude, that's Joe Strummer. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. Wow. He did Johnny Appleseed, which is an incredible song in itself. And then, But his violin player from the Muscaleros unbuttons his button down, and there's a big picture of Jesus with the crown of thorns. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Am I seeing what I'm seeing right now, you know? And, um, you know, that was a once-in-a-lifetime situation, you know. That's and, amazing. Well, yeah. And I, I, I talked to Paul Simonon, actually, in France. We were on a, a venue uh, you know, he was showing his art there, and I was there doing stuff in France. You know, for Wheels and Waves, and we I, I shared that with him. And you know, those are once in a lifetime th- situations in life, and you're just like, oh my gosh, did I just really see that? You know, and you know, I, it, that was another thing with the Clash. Like I was like, wow, like yes, they had he he does Armageddon time, right? Which is I just I have a big painting that. Um, that I did of, the, of of a VH1 video, singing about Armageddon, you know, the Armageddon time, and I think Joe Strummer, like you know, th- however they put music together was so creative. I didn't see it back then, and my daughter actually is really in, was really into the Clash and got me kind of back into the Clash again. Like, oh, I had that combat rock rock record. And you start listening to it, then you start listening to their other records. But I I I I've seen. The Clash grew, like Joe Strummer, I mean, the stuff that they, and how he grew, I think, you know, in his, in his music, you know, in his... I actually think I like The Clash better today than I did when I was in high school or, you know... Well, then you college. think about jo- him doing uh, Redemption song. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Johnny Cash did that, and then Joe Strummer, I don't know if they did it, uh, you know, it, like, they're, have you heard Joe Strummer and Johnny Cash no. version of that? no. It's incredible, and I know the song, but I haven't. Yeah, and you're like, oh my gosh, like you know, incredible points of like. I think I think Redemption song came right before Bob Marley passed away, right? I mean, I wrote that, but you you parallel all these things together, and you're just like, man, it's incredible, like the depth of music, you know, and depth of art, and the depth of you know, and it goes on and on. So the old, so you 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 ask me like how this, this comes about? It just comes about. It flows out. Everything's, yeah, it comes... It's kind of like there was a cartoon called um, cartoon called The Prince of Egypt. Mm. And Moses is talking to Jethro, I guess, or to the Jethro. To, uh... uh it was his wife's dad. And oh, he was, yeah, I think it is Jethro. Jethro, okay, yeah. yeah um, okay. And he, he talks <laughs> about the tapestry of life, how we're one thread in this tapestry of life. like, And... You know, I think being an artist, you see more of the, sometimes maybe you can experience, or a musician, you can experience that, you know, and see it like, oh, I can relate to that tapestry, you know, or whatever, you know. Maybe some people, all people relate to that, but for me, I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. We're like one thread in this tapestry of life, you know. Well, and I think to your point, too, that's also where we find maybe some meaning to our life, right? I think when people feel like they're just a cog in a machine or their life doesn't have meaning, it's... When, when life is difficult, it's just difficult. But when we feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves and we feel like our thread matters in that tapestry, when things are difficult or they're not easy or you're working through some deep suffering, yeah. it gives you a reason to keep pushing through maybe. Well, if I, if I could tell anybody anything, I would say, you know, if, if you're ever confused and you do not know what to do, wait mm. for a day. God's so faithful to go, oh, he'll inspire you. Like, oh, I mean, I don't have to inspire myself. No, just wait for a second. Just give it a little time. Maybe it, it's coming in a day or a two days or three, but it will come, and you will act on that, and you'll see miracles. And that's what I tell people because I've, I've lived it. 
I would you, everything you're seeing is is that that inspiration. There's a, a good friend of mine from from school from Wheaton. Um, she's was a she was a, re, a, a writer for religion for the Chicago uh, Sun Times. Mm-hmm. She got close with um, with the band U2, and uh-huh. you know they were kind of punk early, and then they became more popular. Oh yeah, I know that. Yeah, Bono. And but, but their um, their priest growing up, this Episcopalian priest who kind of later just kind of became more generally Christian, uh, Jack Heeslip. I got to do a couple book projects with him, and he did this great sermon at one point at Little Church by the Sea where we were going. Where he said, you know, there was he was preaching on a something out of Paul's got Paul's letters, and he said, you know, he was asked by a local church in Germany where he was going to spend like a sabbatical. They said, well, what is it you're bringing to the table? What are your special gifts? And his answer was, you know, my special gift is I'm really good at being lazy in God's sovereignty. Mm. He said, you know, my I think it ties into what you were just saying that this. He said, you know, I, I'm willing to let God show me where to participate and not try and force His hand. Yeah. Um, tell me some about that because in you're kind of hinging on that idea you, you have a song on your new album that talks about this mystery of what happens when we're not here anymore oh, right. and maybe it kind of ties into your you know I, I love hearing wh- how people feel the universe works like what's at the root of it all where does it come from we kind of know these ideas about the big bang and, and right. the, the universe expanding but What's the origin? Where does it all come from? What's this mystery that, that you sing about in that song? Well, imagine... I just had coffee, so... Imagine <laughs> not growing up in the church, and then also, you know, uh, imagine, um, you know, a guy coming out, you know, and say, you want to accept Christ as your Savior, you know, under a lifeguard tower, and imagine, uh, you know, being wooed to the Lord, and then you may meet the love of your life, and then imagine, uh, you know, all this... All the struggles of like, of of life, and then imagine you know coming to the point where, uh, you don't even know what's coming next, and and just going through all that horrible, uh, oppressive. As the evenings coming and the haunting and all that stuff, and then. And then. Y- you come to a point where. Uh, you just let it all go, and you're like, "What? What do I? Uh, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do?" And then inspirations come, and then inspirations come, and then inspirations come, and then you're like, and then you hear pastors and preachers, and and and, and all these people that um, uh, there's the knocking the yeah, that's good, yeah. but uh, that's okay, um, and. and, and and then you hear some like hints of people going, well, God's voice is very calm and very quiet. You know, it's in the quiet. And then you're like, okay, so you're listening to it really quiet. <laughs> you're like, okay, you know. And, and and then and then another thing that I always say that that hits me all the time is God makes a way. Somehow God will make a way. He'll use a television show. He'll use somebody. He'll use this. He'll use a daily bread devotional. He'll use a little, uh, an illustration of something in your life. Somehow God will make a way in your life to, to bless you in a way that you know he's real. So then, my gosh, your life is rolling and you're up again and you're doing well. And then you're like, oh my gosh, like I couldn't picture living without my wife now. Or I can't, what about my daughter? Like, and, and, and her uh, and her life and her you know what about the love of her life and what about you know you start seeing it. and then you're like you're, then you're like well, wow like uh, man if you really study artists they don't live past or, or people in general <laughs> the the general thing is uh, maybe 70 yeah maybe 50s 70s maybe 80s man if you can live 90s that's so it's like wow lord okay like, I'm here now, and I'm seeing, I see what a blessing it is to have lunch with somebody, you know, to, like, with the love of your life, and or, or, ha- or hanging out like we are now, like, in this time, you know? And then it's like, well, what, what are we going to do forever, you know? And, uh, well, I don't know what we're going to do forever, but I know that I'm going to be with you. And that's where that song came. 
I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but I know I'm going to be with you. And that's how that song came about. <laughs> no, it struck me. That I, I love that so much because I, you know, I think we both have been around a lot of people with faith who yeah. think they need to have the answer. And, you know, there's, there's something to that. And I'm not trying to tell people that, no, that, I know, that they can't right. have that. No, because everybody's got their own path. that they're. Yeah, and, and that's okay. I, I just felt like in my own, I think we had a lot of connection there in my own story, those answers never seem terribly fulfilling in a deep, meaningful way. And, and the being, you know, there's a point where maybe you have a big enough view of the world where you start to say, well, you know, being lazy in God's sovereignty, being comfortable with the mystery, not being afraid of doubt because we love the mystery, yeah. becomes a place of maybe even deeper comfort than having a set of answers, of the, knowing how to get the true false questions right. Um, That's what saved me through COVID, yeah. being creative. I was afraid of nuclear war. Are you kidding me? DEFCON 5, right. the day after all that cr- crazy movies that came out of the 70s and the 80s, and COVID hits, and it's like, like it was so beyond me because and I was like, what do I do? And uh, I was inspired to build a quarter pipe and <laughs> skate with all the children in the neighborhood in do our cul-de-sac. Yeah. Uh, Politically, man, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing here? What do I do here? You know? And it was like, again, beauty out of ashes. Uh, I'd see a little uh, a little neighbor girl that purposed in her life to learn how to skateboard during co- right when COVID hit. And I'm like, I'm seeing this, this wonderful inspiration happening in the darkest of times, you know? And it's like, whoa, like, oh, there is a God. You know, meaning like, whoa, Lord... Like, and then, and then, like, oh, my gosh, people getting all freaked out, and it's like, man, I can't, like, that's not where, the Lord doesn't want us to be freaked out. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear. He doesn't want us to worry. It's like, uh, oh, man, I don't know. I can't post anything about surfing, man, because my, my friends in France, they can't even surf right now. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I'm not going to rub it in their face. Don't you think that, that maybe that person in France would be stoked that you can actually surf right and they would take a light you know uh, something to do in a way that includes yeah. them oh yeah. yeah see it's crazy i think it no i think that's profound i think you know one of uh, mark pentecost who's the founder of this company i'm at it and works. i still don't know if that was right or wrong <laughs> no well, I, you I know what i mean also but, i'm not sure there are right or wrong answers there's uh, so many things going on during covid i think doing our best but he was just saying you know whenever you feel down whenever you feel freaked out go serve somebody and when you go and serve somebody, it seemed to liberate us. I mean, when I first showed up here, you had cones out in the cul-de-sac, and you were showing this young girl in the neighborhood how to how to hot dog, how to skate cones. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, my little my buddy next door, John John, uh, that I watched grow up, and his brothers, and we just you know, we've done had a lot of skate stoke, you know, and and uh, you don't even see it coming, you know, you don't realize that you're building relationships in these little guys and pretty soon you're like wow that's really cool you know you in hindsight you look back at that stuff you know or people will come up to me yeah i I remember you know you telling me this thing or that thing at becker or whatever you know when i was younger and thank you or whatever and you said yeah investing in other people i guess you know i I think too that you you, the way you live your life is so liberating to a lot of other people i know I, i Part of the reason that photo of you was on our wall was because you don't see people, especially in the surf lineup, right? In the surf lineup, a lot of people don't want to talk. They're, it's all about a style or a thing or a, 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 some, something I'm trying to present to the world versus, and you know, the surf community isn't always the most liberating community. You know, it's like two fins, three fins, longboard, shortboard, you know, there's so SCPs, many arguments, right? Yeah. SCPs, wave storms now. And My gosh, dude, it was gnarly this year. And so, oh yeah, no, for sure. And, but I think when like when you show up with a kook box, which is a 1930s hollow wooden board and a helmet and goggles and some crazy outfit on, you know, vintage rubber or whatever you're wearing, and you just you you I was you, a wool sweater. You are it was a wool sweater. Not the easiest to sw- swim in, by the way. And by the way, you're the guy having the most fun in the water at that point. You know, I mean, to, to, the impression is that that you're the guy that's just expressing himself as freely and as openly as possible. I really think that that you're fueling Stoke in a way that's completely different than 99.9% of the people in the lineup. 
And that is so liberating um, because it gives us all permission to maybe try something different, yeah. express ourselves a little more, yeah. and try and find what that purpose is in our lives, that, that thread that ties the yeah. tapestry together. Well, I was at the skate park this morning, and I, I was watching this guy, He's so articulate in new school skateboarding, uh, and I complimented him. I, I was like, dude, you are such a good skater, and he was older, Yeah, probably, you know, not. he's probably in maybe 30, 32 something like that and he goes yeah he goes I just got back into skateboarding and but I was watching him and I was like wow like like it's really a rad thing to see somebody that that is just expressing themselves where they're at and and working on their stuff and seeing it all come about you know whether it be any I mean it could be any facets of whatever just in surfing I've always been a throwback yeah and Phil Becker that just recently passed away that that one of the founders of Becker Surfboards and, and and was actually shaped for Rick surfboards as well before before Becker. Um, then Rick Stoner had passed away and they started Becker surfboards with Dave, Steve Mangeli that that owns the factory and then Dave Hollander, um, which was my boss, he was the CEO. But anyway, um, anyway, I, I, I forgot what I was just gonna say now. Uh, <laughs> what was I gonna say? Um, uh, you're ta- we were talking about like the new school skater and how people kind of express themselves and yeah, yeah. Um, how Becker was maybe doing that. Yeah, but um, you're definitely going somewhere with it. I know. Dang it! Oh well. <laughs> That's part whatever. Of, part of being in our fifties. Part of being d- d- yeah being yeah. Well, I I want to thank you, Brian, for feeling my stoke and yeah. for being who you are and living your life so authentically. You know, it's what on this podcast we call being truly kick aspirational is mean means you know, living life in a way that's um, authentic, that's honest, that's out of bounds, and that has something you know is driven by values that that's going someplace. And I think you know. Even though by your own admission you might not always know exactly where you're going, I think every day those values are directing you to do something that's important. Yeah. And we're all lucky to be able to uh, to see it, participate in it, and, and totally. be a part of it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely radness to the max. <laughs> if you could, uh, if you could just you know, I, I always I always you know that voice in your head that's always trying to sabotage like that Beastie Boys song. You know, I always think of that man. <laughs> You know, uh, by the way, if you ever want to watch a rap concert, I think it's Beastie Boys. Not that I'm a beast. I, I don't even listen to the Beastie Boys too much, but when I travel, you yeah. know, overseas, I would I, I come on to the like two, 1999 or 2000 live in Glasgow. Yeah. And uh, wow, what a what a concert! And at the end, one of the last songs is uh, is is that one sabotage and it's just so radical it's just pumping it's just pumping in it you know you, you got to know that unfortunately we have your thoughts that try to sabotage sabotage you and you know that, you know you don't have to listen to that voice it's that inspiration rick warren said uh, you know you have three enemies it's you know the, the devil the world and and your own mind you know and 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 you know, he goes, you know, the, the Holy Spirit wants to inspire, you know, and um, that's, and when he said that, it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, he's our inspiration, you know? Right. And, 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 and so I, that's what I, I remember hearing about that, because uh, he lost his son around the same time I lost mine, and, you know, I listened to his grieving tapes and stuff, but uh, I, I just remember, yeah, uh, inspiration uh, it's the spirit in us. It is a spirit, and that's that's the that's the, the so stay inspired, you know, for to stay inspired. Radness to the max. Radness. That's awesome. Radness. Uh, I, I hope you've trademarked it because I'm gonna start using that. No, no, go. <laughs> Just Rad- kidding. I've heard radness I love it. more. Yeah, yeah. No, yes. I love that. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank yeah, you for spending time with me, yeah. and uh, thank you for letting me participate in your art. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This has been the Kick Aspirational Podcast. That was Brian Bent. Uh, if that didn't inspire you, I don't know what does. Uh, whatever you do this week, as we say here, please get out there and be Kick Aspirational, or, as Brian says, create radness to the max.
I have a son, he is in heaven I will see his face again When I see him, he'll be smiling I'll be smiling right back to him Don't you know? Don't you know?